I've been playing Battletech for a lifetime, and it's my passion to bring the tabletop experience to as many people as I possibly can. I want to keep having great games with you. I'm Tuck Davian, and together with a talented group of freelancers and dedicated fans, we're out on the open road, searching the country for players with guts who will join us and feel the DACA one more time on Battlebound. It's finally time for Season 3, Battletech fans! Wherever you are and however you may be watching, Battlebound invites you out on the road to tour the space lanes with us as we trek our way through the American Northwest on an epic 20-day road trip covering several points between Oklahoma and Oregon, on down to California and back across the Southwest through Texas to find ourselves back home again. Starting out on our loop around the nation is Portland, Oregon. Portland had a flair all of its own, and as well as being home to the Portland Trailblazers, it was host to more game shops in one 10-mile radius than I could shake a stick at. True believers, I was stuck in a position of needing somewhere to set this game up and get it shot, and most of the shops we visited had still not reinstituted in-store gaming. My last effort before calling it a day and looking for alternatives was Cloudcat Games. Cloudcap was a wonderful little shop, full of flavor, warmth, and all kinds of tabletop nerdiness. Thanks to the kindness of Phoenix and owner Ty, we were able to get our little setup built and ready in no time flat. So a special thanks to you, Cloudcap Games, and check them out if you have the time. And now that we've reached the coast, let's load up some old school pirate action for Portland by the numbers. Two pirate lords came to blows in the deep periphery in a contest of wills, egos, and sheer guts over a land war that had come down to this final battle. The two pirate kings were breeze flapping daddies of the old school, and their personal mechs reflected that. The Atlas, the King Crab, intimidating, old, and angry. Along with their trusted lieutenants and hardened fighters, these lords of war are clashing on a patch of land on the infamous Blood Island. There is no finesse here. Each pirate lord is hell-bent on stomping out the competition at all costs, or to die trying. What follows is the Battle of Blood Island.
The time for talking was over, and the time for action was now. The fate of Blood Island was about to be decided, and Il Manticoro was in no great rush to play his enemy's game. Under the morning's red sky, he kept his prepared defensive position, and commanding from the top of a rugged hill, he studied his enemy on the radar of the King Crab's heads-up display. His rival sent one of his lieutenants up first inside of a warhammer, which is a mech just good enough to get the job done. You know this by now. The response, of course, was to order a lieutenant of his own into a fire support position, and his archer pilot carried out these wishes. Hobbs had known his enemy since they were children, and he'd played chicken with this opponent before. Without flinching, Hobbs' response was to get more of his big iron into a protected firing position to await the advance of his old foe. Having seen the lumbering Thunderbolt and Warhammer massing on the battlefield's southwest side, Il Manticoro's second-in-command sprang into action. The tremors of the Battlemaster's mighty feet could be felt even across the battlefield, and this finally pressed Hobbs into motion. The terrifying frame of the Atlas came into the view of Manticoro's men, and Hobbs made sure the mech's famous Death's Head was staring straight ahead at his enemies like the infamous Jolly Roger. The last mech warriors of each side made their respective plays, leaving Hobbs and his warriors looking like a close-knit team and Manticoro's men being spread out. The question would soon be whether or not Hobbs' team could drive a wedge through the wall of pain his opponent had erected, and Manticoro's men were flashing their steel. With a sure shot born of a steady hand, Calico Jewel Kolsher sent out a molten blast of azure light from her thunderbolt, melting armor away from the enemy dragon's torso. Her missile screamed past, but joined by autocannon fire from her cohort inside the Wolverine, the unlikely assault left the dragon pilot paralyzed, unable to bring himself to fire back. First blood belonged to Hobbs. With the flood of reports coming in over the calm line, Mentecoro decided to come see the enemy's actions himself. Hobbs' plan of action, however, was firm, and his warriors made their stand as Mentecoro approached. He was sure he knew what Hobbs was doing, and sent his archer pilot to make a trip around the battlefield's northwest side to flush out his enemy and his men. Hobbs saw this maneuver and would not be stayed from his course. If the enemy wanted to confront him, he'd meet them head-on, regardless of how they approached. While he took defilade and prepared to train his crosshairs, Mentecoro's lieutenant decided not to play into the enemy's hands. The time was not yet right for a full frontal assault. This sentiment was not shared by the Warhammer pilot, and its commander, daring Dave Stevens, was having none of it. He lurched the heavily armored machine up and over a rise, just in time to see the enemy dragon zip past and into cover, apparently bolstering the moves made by the archer pilot just a moment ago. Spurred on by his lancemate's bravery, the Wolverine pilot followed suit and leapt out into a quarry for a better look at the enemy. If Manticoro wanted a shot at him, Hobbs was prepared to give it. Having seen the writing on the wall where the movements of his other mech warriors was concerned, he pushed up and over the nearby hill, making a juicy target out of himself and daring all comers to try their luck. With the enemy dragon pilot continuing its previous mission, Hobbs knew it was time to split. 
Calico Jewel and her Thunderbolt darted up to join her commander, and the sight of Hobbs in the clear was just too much for Manticoro to ignore. He threw down the throttle inside his king crab and made all speed toward Hobbs, who smiled grimly from behind the death's head of the Atlas. Manticoro's approach gave the Wolverine pilot goosebumps, and in a moment of panic, he leapt his machine up and away from the king crab, preferring to stay close to his bigger fellows. Hobbs checked his heads-up display and saw Manticoro's men attempting to set up a pincer attack. This was no matter. He was inside an atlas, and flanked by his lance mate inside the Warhammer, the pair presented a unified front, with the others making supporting actions. This display of force projection was enough to send Manticoro's lieutenant inside the Battlemaster stumbling backwards, looking to change his attack vector going forward. Hobbs and his men turned their guns on Manticoro's King Crab. A hail of missile fire, laser bursts, and particle cannon blasts all flew toward the King Crab's wide frame, but none connected. Manticoro's shots were also thrown off due to the evasive action he'd taken to avoid the savage fusillade from Hobbs' men. Manticoro found himself hoping that the other two warriors involved in this pincer attack made their way back very shortly, or things were about to get dicey. The timing of the moment was critical, and Hobbs stole the momentum back for himself, leaving Manticoro on the move. While his archer pilot attempted to complete his maneuver around to the enemy position, Hobbs gave the situation a side eye and marched forward, keeping out of the archer pilot's sight and keeping his attention on Manticoro laser focused. Over the comlink, Hobbs received news coming from inside the Warhammer. Staying stalwart in his hilltop position, Daring Dave had reported Manticoro's right-hand man inside the Battlemaster was quickly approaching, and turning his head to the side reported the same about the enemy dragon. The pincer was beginning to come together, and Hobbs knew he needed to buy time. Ordering Calico Jewel to take point in her thunderbolt, Hobbs looked on with a steely resolve as Manticoro took the bait. Hobbs sprung the trap, sending the Wolverine pilot screaming past the fracas in a flanking maneuver to bring his iron against Manticoro's, and perhaps the four of them could send him down to see old Hob. Manticoro's aim was thrown off by a thunderous barrage from Hobbs and his men. Particle cannon fire tore into the King Crab from Daring Dave, backed by laser fire from Calico Jewel's Thunderbolt. Hobbs could hardly believe his eyes as the report from one of the King Crab's massive auto cannons did nothing to throw off the Wolverine pilot's aim. Beset from all directions, Manticoro managed to connect with a laser blast, but had spent his concentration there instead of keeping himself steady under fire. His machine shuddered under the burst of withering fire from his enemies, and down he went. Hobbs had managed to disrupt one half of the strategy his opponent had attempted to play on him, and Manticoro knew being in front of the initiative going forward would be key. Poseidon smiled upon him, and Manticoro got his wish. With Manticoro's right-hand man fast approaching inside the Battlemaster, Daring Dave finally took his warhammer down off of the hilltop and prepared himself for action. With the enemy dragon pilot having taken such a wide angle so far out of the action in the execution of his maneuver, the pilot inside the Wolverine wanted out. Banking on Manticoro engaging one of his bigger fellows, he bolted his machine away from the main scuttlebutt and off in an eastern attack vector. 
Manticoro calmed himself and thought about his predicament. The pincer was broken, he needed support, and his archer pilot was all too ready to provide it. Hobbs saw the Wolverine pilot's plight and brought Calico Jewel back to further lure Manticoro in, but this action was for nothing. Hobbs' heart jumped into his throat as he watched the King Crab's gangly, gargantuan frame rise from the soil, make a 180, and charge straight for the pilot he felt had embarrassed him just a moment ago. A beef with him he could understand. A beef with his smaller lancemate. This would not be tolerated. With righteous anger and thumbing the trigger release for his own massive autocannon, Hobbs pushed the Atlas forward as fast as it would go, swearing out a blood feud against Manticoro as he did. Not wanting to wade into a crossfire, Manticoro's lieutenant inside the Battlemaster calmly backpedaled and trained his guns on his commander's target. Hobbs opened fire on Manticoro as soon as his missiles had tone. Despite only connecting with a single laser and a paltry burst of missile fire, he was treated to the sight of his Wolverine pilot having bested Manticoro again. The force of his mid-class autocannon slamming into the King Crab's cockpit sent Manticoro reeling, his own autocannon and laser fire sailing well over the head of his intended target as his machine toppled to the dirt yet again. As daring Dave's particle cannon blasts sailed past the falling Manticoro, Calico Jewel struck pay dirt. Her long-range missiles carved deep pockmarks in the torso of the enemy archer, and the smoke from the explosions threw off the aim of his own long-range missiles against her commander. The only successful shots from Manticoro's remaining men were a pittance in comparison to Hobbs' warriors nearly relegating their commander to the past tense. For Il Manticoro, the situation was going from bad to worse. Hobbs knew this was it. His rival was foundering, and his men were left scattered, and there would never be a better time to make a move. Ordering Daring Dave to bring his warhammer up to support the action he would soon take, Manticoro's dragon pilot finally completed his wide-angle maneuver and pulled up to the rear of Hobbs and his gang. Manticoro would wait to cast the die in this game of liar's dice until the perfect moment, which would soon present itself. As he watched the Wolverine sail past him through his cockpit glass, he lifted himself and his machine up with a gritty determination, wanting to take one more cut at the Wolverine pilot. He plodded methodically forward, but Hobbs had other plans. He brought Calico Jewel forward to guard him as he prepared to launch himself at the enemy with full speed and completely disregarding the approaching Battlemaster coming to aid his rival, Hobbs kept the throttle redlined and plowed directly into the face of his decades-old foe. The pilot inside the archer, horrified at the sight of the Atlas charging mercilessly downfield, remained motionless and did his best to train his crosshairs on the enemy commander. And thus began the Showcase Showdown. Hobbs gave the signal, and he, along with his warriors, drenched the King Crab in righteous fire. The gigantic frame of Manticoro's assault neck twisted and turned under the impact as his lieutenant screamed for orders. He righted himself and locked eyes with Hobbs one last time. Blasting away with his autocannons, the cries for orders coming in over his calm falling on deaf ears, Manticoro sent one slug directly into the dirt and the other slamming into the leg of the Atlas. The Atlas bowed slightly and Hobbs rose back to send his final message. Short-range missiles screamed from the tubes and exploded all over the King Crab's torso, with the final missile turning the lights off inside forever and sending Manticoro to Davy Jones' locker. 
As the rest of Manticoro's men fired blindly after waiting so long for his orders, the lot of them knew what the score was. No boss equals no paycheck. Out of their combined efforts in the face of losing their commander, the trio of Manticoro's remaining men could connect with no more than a single mid-class laser. For them, desperation was setting in and panic was beginning to creep up onto the doorstep. His old rival was gone, but there was no time to sit around and sort out how he felt about it. Hobbs had bigger fish to fry, and with Mentecoro out of the way, he decided it was time to focus on the Battlemaster. He backpedaled to meet the oncoming threat, and the pilot inside the archer was nearly paralyzed with fear. He hid at the base of the hill where he'd just witnessed his commander's death and clung to the rocks for dear life. With Hobbs' men so tightly concentrated, it was all the rest of Manticoro's men could do to hide themselves away, as they clamored amongst themselves for a better attack vector. However, Hobbs' men were on the move, and they weren't slowing down. With Calico Jewel making a break for the Battlemaster, Manticoro, second in command, had seen enough. He backed off into a defensive position and hoped he could lure some of Hobbs' team into a crossfire between he and the archer. And Mentecoro's right-hand man got his wish. Both he and the archer pilot clipped Calico Jewel's thunderbolt with as much firepower as they could muster, but despite this, she would not be moved, as missile and particle cannon fire melted armor away from her 65-ton brawler's frame, she leaned into it and delivered some fire of her own. Her burst of laser and missile fire struck the Battlemaster with decent force, but that was the end of any luck for their side. Jarred by the fearsome assault on Calico Jewel, Hobbs and his Wolverine pilot had the vast majority of their shots go wide. Even Hobbs could not connect with more than a quarter of the Atlas's long-range missile payload. However grim it appeared, it wasn't a total loss. When the smoke cleared, Calico Jewel's Thunderbolt was still standing, and she, along with her teammates, were very eager to exact their revenge. As Daring Dave kept his throttle all the way down to aid his fellow, Hobbs decided to leave the wounded lieutenant to his men, and he would give the pilot inside the archer something to shoot at, if that's the game he wanted to play. While the Battlemaster's pilot kept limping backward to prolong their firing position, Hobbs and his team began the execution of their plan. The Wolverine pilot darted up to keep the enemy's attention, and Hobbs looked on as the Dragon pilot took an observatory position. With a single word, Hobbs and Calico Jewel split off from each other, with Jewel taking her enemy toe-to-toe -to -toe and Hobbs cutting off any support from the Archer. The Archer pilot, for his part, could do nothing more than flee. Hobbs wasted no time locking up with the archer and with grim determination blasted it completely off its feet effortlessly. His massive autocannon pierced a flaw in the archer's torso armor and left its gyroscope heavily damaged, its engine bleeding heat like a stuck pig. Because you don't fuck around with someone else's teammate not get the business end of his walking stick. While the conclusion to this duel was playing itself out, the rest of Manticoro's men could only claim a small modicum of success against Hobbs warriors, whose own efforts had resulted in no more than a mediocre return report. This was inconsequential. Hobbs had cleaved his enemy inside the archer to the brisket, and Manticoro's right-hand man knew that if things didn't turn around soon, Davy Jones would surely come knocking.
After jockeying for position as long as they could, the writing was on the wall for Manticoro's men, and Hobbs seized all battlefield momentum that he could. The archer pilot was frozen with fear, his mech was being held together by spit and wishes, and he no more wanted to dance with Hobbs again than he wanted to be keel-hauled by the ghost of his commander. It was at this point Calico Jewel plotted her revenge. With nowhere to run to, she threw her thunderbolt toward the enemy battlemaster with boiling water running through her veins. If he wanted to stab at her, she'd stab right back. With the archer no longer a threat and his fellows massing to take down Mentecoro second in command, Hobbs pushed forward, if only to watch the fireworks if he couldn't get into an effective range in time. The southern edge of the battlefield was turning into a meat grinder as mech after mech popped in to join the gnashing of teeth. With the archer pilot trembling behind a rise, all eyes were on Il Manticoro, second in command. Time seemed to slow down as particle cannon blasts, missiles, and lasers all cut into his battlemaster's hide, but the final blow came from Calico Jewel. With her thunderbolts lasers, she reached out and surgically opened the Battlemaster's torso, exposing the ammunition bays contained therein. A follow-up blow later, and the Battlemaster was history, the deafening ammunition explosion sending shockwaves through the soil. It would be the final nail in the coffin for Manticoro's men. The only thing left to do now was make the sacrifice play. Hobbs was firmly in command, and the pilot inside the archer knew he needed to buy time for his fellow inside the dragon to escape. Finally getting control of his nerves, he'd moved out to draw Hobbs and his pilots away from the fleeing dragon, and the ploy worked. As Calico Jewel kept with the escaping dragon to harass and damage it on the pilot's way out, Hobbs and his lancemates laid into the archer. Calico Jewel chased down the fleeing dragon. Let him go, she was told. Let him take home the message that Blood Island belongs to the tiger. And after that swashbuckling adventure, we find ourselves with the segment of the show we like to call After the Action. All right, Battletech fans, it's After the Action time. You know how it is, you know how we do. So, uh, you know, I seem to recall, I seem to recall this conversation about, uh, it was something along the lines of I was going to get my ass you handed to me. You got lucky with the king crab. You, you took it out by the head. So <laughs> okay, okay, you're, fine. You're okay, fine. Point, I, so. I will, I will give that to you. Taking out that king crab very early on. First, it was the PPC to the brain that, that set me up. Well, single, and then it was a that single last. S a single SRM. Yeah. Last short range Shot. missile from the Atlas. That... Exacted out by two points of damage. <laughs> hey, a W is a W, no, folks. It is. <laughs> it is. So, and then the later point that Gyro hits to the Archer. Yeah. Where it definitely is like, well. But I, I feel like. I think I think it was still a very good game. I did have you doing. My tactics were working. I had you chasing. Chasing me around mountains. You did, and yes. So I was at one point. I was like, "This is like yakety sacks, man." Like just trying to chase them around. Okay, hold on. Here's where I think that that things went wrong for you. The mobility of your Wolverine definitely. That Wolverine is scrappy, and you know what? He doesn't get enough love. The the ten cannon medium laser variant of the Wolverine. I don't see anybody ever use it hardly. Yeah, it's a Davian variant because they have that big auto cannon fetish, right? But that thing is solid. No, it was, you can throw it, fifteen it did, damage on a five eight five murder platform. Just, Come just on. Keeps getting the the three defense with that jumping that he was doing the whole game. So. And he carries twenty rounds for that auto cannon. This game ain't going twenty turns. You're gonna have plenty of opportunity nah, to shoot that thing. Dozen turns, right? Eleven. Yeah, we went to we went 12 on this, yeah, but so. there were times I didn't get to shoot it. So I think when you deployed, you deployed on, number one, the wrong side. If it were me, I would have stuck to that terrain at first. But 
that that's debatable. You you got away from that fast enough, so that wasn't really the big deal. I feel like the big deal there was deploying so far apart. You had all your guys spread out over yeah. one side of the map, and I just said, I'm going to make all my guys close no, together. That's, that's definitely what you work to, uh, to your advantage. And like I said, I haven't played in a long time. It's like, well, next time I think I would deploy, deploy them in pairs. Pairs get, is good. To get to get more of the, the C on you because then you'd have, I'd have to divide your force and then I'd be able to concentrate fire better. But I was like, yeah, I was definitely a little more spread out than was good for me. A lot of times game. I like to take them and I'll go two here, two here, but not too far apart, just like yeah. that. And we'll start moving and then I'm going to watch what way the battle is going. And then I'll take my, either these guys or these guys and I'll move them up together to draw everybody to try and follow me while I'm pushing forward somewhere yeah, else. You moved as a unit, whereas like mine were like, we're moving in a general direction to try and divide your forces but at the end we did divide the forces you did yes but not fast enough and you know there was there was a couple of times you know i admit that that i moved purposefully because i was like look i'm gonna box you in this canyon one way or the other here mm -hmm. and that one was when i moved the atlas up and I told you this at the game shop, I said the thing about this move is I can turn my torso this way and shoot the archer if that's what I want. Or I can turn my torso that way and shoot the battle master if I yep, want. I but I had to put the atlas in between the archer and the battle master and the wolverine so that, or the thunderbolt, whichever one it was, the point is, is I was putting him there to make you shoot at him. Because I was like, I have to get him up here so that I don't get, oh, it was the thunderbolt, that's what it was. Because yeah. I remember you'd have had a clean back shot on the thunderbolt if yeah. I didn't stick the atlas in your face. Right. And I said, this guy's got armor for days. I can do that. I got to throw him up there. And Can I knock that thing down, what, twice, you think? Yeah, twice. He, he shucks. The, the last turn of the game, yeah, I mean, after I got that, that final gyro hit, he still fell over anyway, so I guess he was, <laughs> you know, having a few drinky poos there, you know, while he was in the cockpit. But he did the job, you know, he got it done. And so I guess that leads me to my next question. If, if you had the opportunity to change anything that you've done, besides what you just talked about, what would you have done differently? I think I would have deployed in, uh, more... Compact? More, um... The pair, I still would have gone pairs when had them split just down the line. It's like, oh yeah, we'll just sweep this way. And also the uh, how they did in the battle. It's been so long since I played. Like, I need this. The the dragon is trash by itself. <laughs> it is, the it's, poor dragon. It's, it's it's a support mech. It lasted to the end. He ran away. Yeah. Well, so, I mean that, that's a, that's a and fair. It's just like, yeah, I feel like yeah, tactic. Li live another day. So in the rematch, I need that dragon back. Uh huh. And he came back with his homies. I think. And so <laughs> continue this story of, you know. So maybe the uh, the Wolverine. See the come the, back into the next game, you know, keep a story going. The the dragon by itself gets a lot of hate. No, you know, it's a good, it's a I think mech. that it's it a solid range. mech. You've got your long range missiles. You've got your auto cannon. Sure, that's nothing to write home about. But it's on a five eight body. It's got decent armor. It's got a couple of lasers. It has one butt laser and, and one laser front, out in the front. Right, which is like by itself, it doesn't do a lot. But had I in kept a team, it, when I kept it with the king crab, it might have been a little different because that's that, I feel like that's what happened. Nothing drew the fire from it, so you concentrated the fire on it. Had I left the dragon with it or you, closer to it, it would have been like, hey, stop shooting me with that thing because the limited ammo of the king crab too I was like I didn't pay enough attention to that either at the same time so there were at least three times where I looked at that dragon and you had run it around the back of the battlefield and you I guess were trying to to come up from behind on me give me he the old jack in the box shots on the back you know he did uh but there was at least three times where I looked over at that thing and went, he's cut off. He ain't doing nothing. I don't, what do I care about him? I'm not even going to think about this. I'm going to focus my fire on the guys that I want to focus on. And the first target, you know, of the day had to be that king crab. You get up too close to him and it's all over but the crying. And God, I remember that one time so I had shoot that. both and punch right? both, right? Do what? The king crab can shoot both and punch, right? No, no. Shoot both and kick? It no. can shoot both and kick, yeah. <laughs> you know, which would be 20, 40, 60 damage, you know, in one turn. But there was at least once where I, I had to bait with that wolverine and jump up in partial cover, and you were, like, right there. And I was like, this is risky business, man. It can take, that wolverine can take 220 shells. But it's going to be hurting for certain after that, and that's not, you know, you, something you can pull off more than once. But fortunately, I had the partial cover. That I had three just, defense. Just kept getting away, too. Even at short range, that's still a nine. A three-gunner, you had to run to get there. You have a, a three defense plus partial. At short, that's still, you're going to hit less than half the time. So I had to gamble on that, and that's when I came up on you on the back with that atlas. Yeah. And I think everything I fired at you meant, no, like, we nothing. No, you were face-to-face. The, the, the crab and atlas actually faced off. 
Oh, okay. I shot both when that head crit took it out at the end there. But I did, I did so. get some some back shots on you, and I was really hoping to get inside the torso and and knock out some ammo, which really is what I feel like the final nail in the coffin there was, yeah. is when I came up when you got the battle master. and got the battle master with the critical hit, rolled two SRM, crits, SRM ammo. but I only needed one, blew the SRM ammo, and, and that was the end of that story. And by that time, I had already gotten a lucky through armor critical on the uh, archer, which on had gyro. engine and gyroed it. So no more running for that guy. And... and all I knew then, I chase him down with the Atlas, I get into that center torso, I've just got to get one crit on the gyro, and we can call it good after that. And the, the Atlas, you know, had magically uh, survived several volleys of those those 20 cannons. I think you only hit me with one of them, didn't you? And yeah, but I was pelting you with LRMs with the Archer. Like, I... The, the, the archer the archer did work. I feel like you got hosed on those die rolls at least three or four times where you only needed fives, and I'm like, don't miss, and you'd yeah, roll a three, and I was like, oh, no. Yeah, no <laughs> oh, no. The last two shots from the king crab as it died, actually, I missed the one because I was, like, right there. We were, like, literally one hex apart. So. Yeah, it was like one. Yeah, I think it was one, and, I mean, who knows? That could be nerves. That could be, you know, whatever, but I was just... Oh, I had to count it's, my lucky stars because I expected yeah. to get blasted in that atlas. And I said, I'm just going to have to walk up and be a bullet sponge, and I'm going to have to take it. I mean, the atlas is an assault mech, so that's, it's, that's what it does. Yeah, and, you know, it's it's one of the singular most iconic assault mechs uh, of the franchise. And yeah, no, the no. atlas is, is neat, but a lot of people don't fear it like I feel like it should be feared. And it's, no, it's, it's not... It's very versatile. It is a medium and long-range fighter. And sure. And if you get too close to it, it will rip your arms off. It's... And it's, it's got the battle it. fists. Yeah. You know? It will lay into you. Get up, hit with that 20 cannon, some short-range missiles. Forget the medium lasers. You just bow, bow. And that's where you're going on the punch hit location table. And those are 10-point punches. Yeah. See, you know, you can't go wrong with that. And, you know, the archer had, had taken a couple of moves. And I looked back at him and I just went, I'm concentrating on this. Because I wasn't worried about it. And I knew that the Archer's a heat miser. I love the Archer, don't get me wrong. It's such a great heavy mech. You, ARC 4M, oh, one of my babies. But that particular one, you can't shoot the 20 racks and not gain Constantly. You know, heat. Yeah, I, was, I was at seven heat at the end. And so. there are several times I'll look over at those things and just be like, eh, you fired your missiles last time. I'm not worried about it. Because most folks, they don't want to do that. They don't want to hit those movement penalties. And even if they're cool with riding the heat scale, I know if they pull that move on me, well, now you're slow. I can get away from you and not have to worry. So I just got to survive that. But th it didn't end up coming to that. And, you know, I rarely ever have these kind of outcomes like usually on this show and just in my life in general the the games are very give and take and you know yeah i might get an early victory you know out of the gate and and or somebody might get one over on me but the games whether it's on this show or anywhere else they hardly ever go that badly for somebody and i'm not gonna lie to you because you know i love you to death but i do feel kind of bad i was like oh i, I didn't mean for it to go like this oh, no, the, the head, the, it's like oh this guy's out one more <laughs> hit the head and they're out well but and so many get, times that's happened and then you, know, you can never do it on your on your warhammer so i mean yeah same thing like it's just like yeah they happen but there's so many times in games where I not, I get some magic, you know, auto cannon 10 or PPC or something like that to the brain, right? And now the dude's riding a convertible. He's got two points of internal structure left, and I can never get there for the rest of the game. And it just never happens. It's just like... And and that's why I knew I want to shoot these short range missiles. I wanna I wanna get as many opportunities as I can to roll those dice and get those headshots, get those through armor criticals. And if I'm gonna give anybody a piece of advice while you're playing this game and you're shooting guns and you're shooting missiles, always do your direct damage first. Shoot the laser, shoot the auto cannon, shoot the particle cannons, whatever, and then use the missiles to find the holes. And you SRMs know, SRMs are so good at that, honestly. Oh yeah. Like, oh yeah. Just. Especially when you have a six pack, because you're on on average you're going to hit with three to four. And I mean, if anybody doesn't know about average expected damage, here's a video for you. You should go look that up. But yeah, it, it's it's you're always going to get more opportunities to roll those dice with those things, and well, that's what you want. Back in the day, I love that linebacker C. Oh, just <laughs> spread out. We got the linebacker C coming back. 
you know, here here very shortly. I won't tell you too much. I don't want to spoil too much coming to the future there, but I also think that one of your problems had nothing to do with you. It wasn't your fault. It was just the way it was. Was the battlefield this time around was so much more condensed than what you would normally be able to do because we were kind of behind the eight ball on this one. We went to Cloudcap Games and boy, these folks, they bent over backwards for us. They helped us out. They had just gotten a massive order in and normally their game room is all open and you know they're ready for you, but they only had one table <laughs> and they, they let us move some stuff so we could do it, but it's a very short map. And that means the infighting is gonna happen like that. And there's not a lot of places you can run and there's not a lot of places you can hide. But to your credit, you found a lot of places to hide and, and you, you stuck yeah. that out. I just did a lot of waiting. <laughs> the battle master and the archer were just like, I'm gonna just chill and wait. And even running away from you the one time, I got into cover to not be, you know, be able available to be attacked by the Atlas or the Warhammer yeah. while I was trying to get the Wolverine singled out a little bit. But I was honestly okay with that, uh, the, the hiding, because I was like, well, great, you're taking these out of combat. Now I can I can move on the people that I really want to move on and not have to worry that I'm also going to get blasted by this, you know, LRM boat back here or, you know, the, the command mech battle master guy over there. I can just focus fire, kind of do what I want. And then I, I remember saying this at least once. The first time you knocked my atlas down, I was facing a completely different direction other than the direction that I saw the battle going that I wanted to go and he fell over and it was was completely unexpected but I told you know you at that time I was like that yeah, that fall is a blessing in disguise because I'll be able to get up and then I can face any way I want and I can change my attack vector and I can come at that archer so there's there's a big tip for you I mean that's that's mind over you know battle tech right there you always got to be looking at the angles you always got to be playing the side hustles like did I fall over yeah that sucks and you have to let your opponent gloat and they're like oh yeah boy I kicked your butt and but you got to be thinking you got to be like to follow my advantage this game too. Yeah. Like you can face any way after getting up from a fall, yeah. right? Yeah. Because it's like because I remember that back from the old days. Sure. So. And 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 I know that there was there was a couple of times you were concerned about partial cover, uh, speaking of the old days, because you were like, I don't want to get hit on the punch location tables. I'm already driving a convertible here. And I'm like, no 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 we don't do that anymore. That ain't how it works. So let me ask you this knowing what the the partial cover rules were back in the day when you got hit versus what they are now how do you like that i like the new one it's like you, yeah you hit where their legs would be but there's a mountain in the way yeah that too just, bad that makes so much more it sense makes so much more sense yeah and on top of that you only pay a plus one penalty yeah. as opposed to the old days which was plus three penalty was it yeah it was a plus three penalty to shoot at partial cover but a hit was a hit yeah. A hit is going to hit no matter what. It's just going to hit punch locations. And I remember that time we played uh, the last stand of the Black Watch uh, at uh, Dice Addiction, and I lost a, like, pristine thug. This thug had not taken any damage, and some victor came up and blasted it with a gauss rifle and we were playing with the old rules and yeah it took its head clean off and i was like dude you gotta be kidding me <laughs> so i personally like you know the way it does now because it just makes more sense plus it gives you more opportunity to fire it gives you more opportunity to speed the game up Plus, a hit's not always a hit. So when you're in partial cover, when that's you, you can say, okay, yes, you did hit me with your devastating weapon here, but you're coming at me from the front, so fives and nines. Just roll fives and nines all day. And I've had that happen, too, and my opponent is just, Ugh! And it, it can be a defensive tactic as well, not just, you know, making sure that you don't take damage, but also confounding your opponent, which makes them angry, and then they do weird things, and you can capitalize on it. So, it's not always just about, you know, the damage and this. You gotta be thinking, where where else can I take that? So, okay. If you had to come at me again, because you didn't pick these forces. I know I picked I these forces. I, I would actually like something that would I, I would like a scout two heavies and an assault. Instead. I was just about to so ask like you. I needed something with mobility because that Wolverine, seriously, the mobility of the Wolverine definitely was an advantage for you just with the amount of defense that it was developing. It's like, I'm, I don't want to shoot at that. The number is too high. Yep. But it's going to be able to shoot at me just fine. <laughs> so well, I mean, you know, it, it still it does, has to pay a penalty for jumping. but Right, but like, you know, typically it's within range, which is better for it. So, See, this stuff like that, so. came, the, the germ for this scenario came from a, a game we played uh, back home in Tulsa where I was running a scenario and I just moved a couple of things around. But for the most part, you know, it's, it's uh, just the exact same as it was. And you only had a plus seven advantage, I believe, when battle value was concerned. So these forces were as, almost as tight 
as you could get it. I don't feel like it was unfair. No. But I was just about to ask, do you feel like it was unfair? I feel like I should have paid closer attention to uh, the loadouts, like the dragons. I was like, yeah, you're a support mech. I didn't treat it like a support mech. I, right. I feel like if the dragon were something a little friskier, faster, like that would have done me a lot better than what it, what it did in this game. Uh, maybe honestly, so. maybe the next time you could have yourself a grand dragon, which is still 5'8", but instead of that, that lousy 5 cannon, it carries a PPC on it. Dude, that'd be a little more fun. Yeah, you know, and you, could, you can more, hit... A little more oof. Hit... Hit just a little harder. I still don't hate the dragon. I know there's lots of people out there that don't like it, but I didn't feel like the scenario was unfair. I, I'll, I'll tell you now so that you don't feel bad about it. That is a common mistake uh, that I, I, I noticed this so much. So if you guys are doing this, stop. Look at your opponent's record sheets. Yeah. Ask them, can I see your sheet? Look at it. Information is ammunition. I know I just quoted the yeah, old Battletech cartoon, but still. You, once or twice, I was thinking, like, should I look at your sheets? Yes! See what you're doing? Like, yeah, yes! Because we know, in-game, they have specs. It's like, oh, these are the, the mechs they're using right now. We can tell what they are. And so, and then damage assessments, and be like, oh, like, because uh, our cameraman was like, wow, you're trying to take that arm off. Like, wow, you're trying to take that leg off. And me, I actually didn't look at touch sheets the whole game. <laughs> you just got to. And it's just like, I should have. And be like, you know what? It's like, because you can take aim shots, right? You can. For a two or three? It, 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 it's a penalty, but that, that's not really the important thing. The important thing is to look at your opponent's record sheet so you know... Power what weapons it's carrying so you know how fast it can move so you know what kind of armor it's got I mean, and then at, at different intervals like in the ACs game and stuff like that. I remember that. look at your opponent's sheet so you can tell how much damage you've done to it and where you want to hit and and you know so what you can move your your vector to to hopefully get shots on the on the spots that you're looking for and I see. I only don't look at the record sheets because I don't have to anymore. <laughs> I I have read so many technical readouts when I was a child, and I've gone over these so many times that if you put something in front of me and I just read the model number, I already know everything I need to know about it. But if I don't, I will look at that sheet and I will say "gib," and you know, as as Riley Centrella likes to say, "gib." And then I'll be da, da 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 da, and then I can assimilate that information. So always look at the sheets, folks. Look at them. If you want to beat somebody, you got to have all the angles. You got to know all the information. So, but I don't. But like I said, I still don't think it was unfair. No, not at all. Not at all. And I feel like starting out that fight was a powder keg. Like it had just as much potential to kind of go either way. Well, I mean, I'm, pick, I'm looking at picking up a set and practicing for the next time we meet our cross match, <laughs> and I'll have, have a better idea again. It's like, what's hmm. the rematch? Oh yeah, we want the rematch. So. Pot shots in Portland, three, daddy. <laughs> but all in all, I, uh, here, but here's, here's the, the big crux of this biscuit. The big takeaway from this, for me, is not only, you know, did we did we have a crazy fucking fight because you don't get to talk that much about things like that that happen. Like, it doesn't happen to me very often, so that's cool. But honestly, the big crux of the biscuit here for me is is getting out to come and play with you. Yeah. Like, honestly, no, it, was, it, it, it makes me it. feel like a kid again. You know, <laughs> you were just saying that the other day. And, and we had more time to do it this time. The last time, you know, we did it, we had to knock this out really fast. We, we had a get magic game ordered pizza, played our game, ate pizza, and then you left. Yeah, and I had to boogie, like, down to California. So this time, you know, we get that extra time, we can set up the cool battlefield that I never had when I was a kid, and we can take these painted we miniatures. We hosted and... events for that, you know, at the, at the uh, game store back home in San Diego. Where, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Tom and Nadine would set it the old The old lame empire. <laughs> <laughs> but but as a kid, I dreamt of that stuff, like seeing Having, those old yeah. Geohex uh, uh, mountains and terrain and all that. I was wanted that. So so getting to come out here, and you're my best friend in the entire world. Like, if y'all don't know, now you know. Like, I love you like a brother. And getting out here to come and play Battletech with you is probably one of my favorite experiences on the show. Oh, so yeah, thank you for coming. Oh, and and thank you for uh, availing your home to us. Uh, I'm greatly appreciative and on all of your roommates for letting us uh, kick it for a night and stuff like that. It's been a lot of fun, and Portland is a really great city, folks. Like, there is so many game stores out here, you guys. The food the, is great. Oh, man, the, the pizza's killer. It's killer, and There's they so and the coffee is wonderful. Here. Yeah. And, and uh, gosh, I don't even think that we've had time to check out all the different oh, game no, you stores. Didn't, you didn't even see anything, honestly. Like, there is so many more places to go. Like, you didn't cross many of the bridges at all. Right. You didn't get to see Cathedral Park. You didn't go to, we didn't even hit 
a quarter of the game stores. So next time you come, like try and come for like an entire weekend or something. Sure. And I will. I will we will see. We will. We'll go to the grab and grab. And we'll uh, hang out at one of the. Uh, this, we have game shops that have restaurants in them. Sure. Basically. They have. They have full menus. They have taps. They have like all that. And so it's just like you want uh, game pubs. We have those. Um, it's cool. There's a bunch of food carts we didn't get to go to, stuff like that. So yeah, Portland is definitely a game-loving city, and we oh, didn't yeah. find any BattleTech, but it, maybe maybe I'm looking at bringing the love for it here. I'm so. telling you, it is the if you build it, they will come. <laughs> is just like Field of Dreams. You build it up, you're there every week. I've made videos about this. Just do, just do the legwork, and it will come to you. But Portland is one of those you could just you know throw a dart. At, at a side of town and probably find a game store on yeah. it. And the thing is, is the game store that we went to today, Cloud Cap Games, you didn't even know about it. You've never I, been there. I'd, it'd come up in my searches. I just never got around to going to it. Yeah. So, yeah and and you've lived like, here for how long? I've lived here for 11 years. Yeah. See? Like... <laughs> even for somebody who's essentially at this point a native. You know, you've gone native like they did when the clans, you know, came and all, yeah. all the advanced inner sphere scouts like the Black Widows and all them. You know, you'd gone, you've gone native and you hadn't been there. You were like, I've, I've got no scope on this. I've never seen this before. And I'm like, I don't care. We're going. We're going to do it. We're going to figure it out because that's what we do. <laughs> it turned out to be a lot lovely store so you guys if you're in if you're ever in the Oregon area you're passing through you're coming to visit family it doesn't matter what you're here doing if you're into this kind of stuff there's so many spots here for you and the food is is fabulous so I got I got to give big props to Portland on that one yeah we had and, Rudy's pizza too oh yeah Rudy's was all oh, oh, good I'm glad I got some of that take home you know or take out on the road because we're fixing to head off to, to Sacramento I don't know exactly when that that episode is going to air but that's going to be a good one and uh, speaking of good ones, I've had a great time out here. And thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to yeah. have you, man. I love you. Mm -hmm. All right, Battletech fans. So that concludes the very first episode of Season 3, the season that was never supposed to happen out here in Portland, Oregon, folks. Remember, if you like what you've seen so far, do us a favor. Hit that subscribe bell down there and turn on all notifications so you can find out exactly where Battlebound's going to turn up next. Because you never know, Daddy. The season that wasn't supposed to happen happened, and you're going to want to be a part of it, folks. So make sure you do that and leave a comment so you can be part of the conversation. Tell us what you think and tell us right there where you'd like to see Battlebound because you never know. The next featured player may be someone just like you or exactly you. So give it a shot. It can't hurt. But we've had a great time out here today with our featured player here in Portland, Oregon in the Beaver State, Daddy. And we are sure looking forward to seeing you next time out on the Space Lanes on, on Battlebound! Battle smash our like button and subscribe to our channel. Crowdfunding is when lots of people give you small amounts of money to help your passion project come to life.